Friends, colleagues and listeners, here we are again as part of the Care Series uh, with Etihad. And I've got a guest now, and every now and again, it makes you realise that first impressions are something that are quite impactful. And this gentleman definitely made a first impression with me as I met him in the corridor. And um, I'm sure that during the course of this interview, we'll go through what areas of first impressions stood out. But the person I'm talking about is Andrew Stotts, who's the VP Learning and Development with Etihad. And before I introduce you, before you say anything, Andrew, I, I am sure that all of the employees at Etihad have great fun whilst learning. And I say fun, not in a not in a derogatory fashion, but I say because if you can have fun while you're learning, you're eager for more learning. So do you know what? I, last night, sorry, shameless plug. Um, I was voted the the top learning professional in the Middle East and Africa. That was amazing. So we went to an award ceremony last night, which was fantastic. So by my kind of peers and, and industry experts saying, you know, at stars just kind of rocking it, which is amazing. Because I always think I'm the most stupid man in the room, which is mm-hmm. important. But I think there's there's four. There's, I suppose there's four kind of things I always try and remind people of. And there's we we play in on kind of four pitches, I suppose four. You know, four areas of play. There's there's one I think is incredibly powerful, but very very difficult to influence. There's one that's I think very easy, um, but very it has really almost no impact. Um, and there are two where I think the, the battle kind of rages, and where I try to place myself in those two. So the area where I think is incredibly powerful, but I don't think we have it's a very very difficult one to influence is is Chris wanting to do something. Because actually, when Chris really wants to do something, he's almost unstoppable. And it doesn't matter if it's Lubna or Mohammed or Faisal or Andrew or Pete or whatever your name is. Yeah. You know, when you want to do something, you just cannot be stopped. That's really fundamental to humans. The, the, the area which I think is incredibly expensive and not particularly beneficial is making Chris do something. Because when I drag Chris into it, kicking and screaming, he might... It's very easy to measure, by the way. I can definitely measure Chris's success in doing it, but I can't really measure how impactful that is with Chris, yep. so how he's using it and actually deploying that, that knowledge, that information, that behaviour. It's, it's almost impossible, but it's very easy on a bit of paper, on a spreadsheet. Yeah. Beautiful, which is the tick box yeah. exercise that I'll be coming to. Yeah, as well. Everyone loves that. We yeah. love a bit of a tick box. We love, oh, I've got a spreadsheet that says yeah, Chris yeah. did the training. All done. Yeah. Yeah, but actually, no, no benefit, in my humble opinion. Um, the two areas where we really, I think, make a big difference is what I would call accessibility, so can, to making it easy for Chris to try and learn. And actually, if he wants to take the journey, it's very, very simple for him to kind of plug into it. And then the second one is just a bit of marketing around that. Why we talk about why Chris should do it. Some of the benefits to Chris and some of the benefits to Chris's guests, customers, leaders, managers, whatever you want to call those people. So I think that's really, really important. So we we play on those those four pitches the least impactful, most impactful. We tend to find the middle two pitches can and should have, uh, will really, really play. But it's a battle. It's a real battle because the business likes measurement, like every business. I mean, it doesn't matter if you work for Samsung or Hilton or Barclays or Starbucks. And I've worked for all those organisations. They all like the number on the sheet. But the bottom line is actually what's the real benefit to the individual. And, and until one day we find some sort of you know, SD card that we can like plug into someone's yeah. forehead and sort of like download the data and understand what they know, um, it's going to be very hard to measure these individuals, measure success. But yeah, it's well, about how you feel, right? Well, fantastic. What a lovely start. It's the first time I think I've been on a podcast since myself and Salem have done it, where I've apologised to Salem and now I'm going to apologise to Lubna as well. I'm not really interested in the subject matter. I'm enjoying, I'm enjoying <laughs> what I'm hearing from you. We've got our questions and, Chris. No, but seriously, I, I, honestly, what, the way you've just now meandered off it's, it's fantastic. And, and for me, I totally agree with that, you know, and, and for, I always tell people, as children, parents knock the why out of them. Oh. And the why is an acronym for what helps you. And if you don't keep asking questions and understand the why, people keep telling you what to do, when to do it. They don't always show you how to do it, but that why is so important. So yeah, you've, got, you've, you've what, what was it, the um, Jerry Maguire? You had me at hello? You had me at hello, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so uh, you, you got me there, apart from the shoes, which, uh, which we'll come to <laughs> later on. Yes. But seriously, that's obviously why... Uh, like I said, just a very quick, a quick impression. That's why you got the award. Fair play, yeah. That's brilliant. Yeah, it's really, it's really fun. It was nice being, um, being there last night, and uh, a little bit of a rib taking um, from some of my, particularly my, my brother phoned me up this morning, actually apologising for his, uh, his rib taking last night. Uh, he wasn't there. He's, uh, he's, he's back in Ascot, um, but he sent some sort of like 
he, and he said he had a sleepless night afterwards because he kind of like he said to me this morning I, I actually I reflected on it and thought uh, that wasn't that clever and I said Tim it's really fine I'm like <laughs> I'm, I'm fair game mate you know I put myself out there yeah, um, no, and that's what take, take the mic, you know? and that's what you've got to do, and that's that's the best way. No, brilliant, honestly, and I, I I really think that's a lovely way way to look at things. Now, what I just want to ask you now, just getting back onto some of the questions, the industry at the moment now is going through huge pressures. So losing what I call um, people that have got experience, not experience for the word experience, but they 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 understand about judgments and they've been involved in things that have gone wrong and now you've got the energetic younger generations come in and that, and that balance and everything but one of the things that I'm really concerned about is the the tick box exercise with the training mm-hmm. so covid showed a different way of training but a lot of it was lms a lot of it was online and a lot of it there was no interaction so you did it it was recorded you did a memory test not a competency test but you did a memory test which is as good as you can remember on the course. You even got second chance, third chance to retake the tests, etc. But as you said earlier, it was all about keeping records of what's been done, but not how well it's been done and how well it's going to have an impact on the business. So for me, I just want to get your take on what do you think is necessary now to move forward and to change with regards to a focus on competency and practical performance that makes an impact on the business rather than tick box, whether it's certification, accreditation, regulatory or whatever, what do you think now should be done to help people make an impact on the business so that they feel more confident in what they're doing? Yeah. It, it's a, it's a, in my, I suppose in my mind, it's really simple. I think in, in reality, it's quite challenging. I, I'm minded of a, a great question that we were asked in the podcast a few minutes ago. On my, um, we had a, I think called the World Class. And one of the... I was, I was speaking to a, a guest, and what's really beautiful about that podcast is a lot of our previous guests dial in, so sometimes it sort of turns into a panel discussion, and it was fascinating. So obviously, I had a, and I'm always mindful that my my main guest is gets the most kind yeah, of line yeah. during the session, but other obviously previous guests often want to kind of like you know have an opinion. But Andorra asked a great question earlier. She said, "Do you think um, do you think that leaders?" And followers' perception of leaders changes by generation, and I think that's a really we had a really big debate around that. And I think that's a, that's the reality. I think sometimes I think new generations of new generations of followers look to their leaders for different bits of information. They have different expectations yeah. of their leaders. And I think sometimes I'm a generation X, whereas I'm not. I'm old, long in the tooth, grey hair, ugly fat, and I just I have a kind of a way of doing things, and I, which I think kind of works. I think we need to basically sort of mix it up. I spoke at the House of Commons um, recently. I spoke, I spoke at the House of Lords recently in the UK. Um, and the reason I spoke at the House of Lords was because I'd spoken originally, it was an, an education kind of like select committee and they were asking me about education and they were talking about, it wasn't, wasn't in, in sort of professional adult learning, it was more about children. Yeah, yeah. They were trying to take some of my experience of this and you know, about how they could apply it to children. And they, they'd started talking to me and I'm quite innovative and we're quite, we're quite experimental and I'll come on to that in a couple of seconds if I can. Yeah. But I went to, so that was a really fun conversation. And then I got invited back and I was being interviewed by the House of Lords and they were talking about the same time topics and very kind of like a plum in his mouth. Um, I won't mention his name, but but Lord. And um, he asked me, he, he said, I won't try and imitate him. But he was he was saying, Stotts, almost kind of like sneering. I mean, it's not, it's not, let's not go there now. He goes, Stotts, you talk a lot about micro learning. <laughs> yeah. And what do you, could you perhaps you could help the panel understand what, that, what micro learning means? Yeah. And I said, well, so that's a really fantastic question, um, you know, Lord. So, yeah. so. Um, so for me, well, let me talk, let me talk a little bit about my micro learning journey. And there's a couple of really key bits of information. I think the first key bit of information for me is how did how does my my daughter learn? So I have two adult children, yeah. and I look at how my my daughter and my son prefer to learn, and they are 26 and 25, so they have this idea where they would prefer to learn using things like YouTube or TikTok or, you know, or whatever, you know, very, very small, like social media, they do a lot of Facebook learning. So they'll find a recipe um, and they'll basically replicate that. They'll find a, a chef they like, you know, Jamie or, yeah, yeah, or yeah, whatever. Yeah. And then they repeat the recipe, right? And their success rate is really high. And the beautiful thing is they can kind of rewind it and they can have a look at it. And then there's this thing 
called Ebenhaus. So I'm not sure whether you're familiar with Ebenhaus, if anyone's listened to Eben, about Ebenhaus, but Ebenhaus talks about um, forgetting curve and it's about how people go about learning things and how they retain information, which is quite fascinating. So we've then been playing not only with kind of micro learning, which was actually really interesting because when when I then said, when, we, when I started my project on micro learning, probably about four or five years ago now, when I started that, we, we set ourselves this kind of idea that we wouldn't go anything longer than three minutes because we felt that three minutes was yeah, yeah, probably, yeah. but that was probably, that would be pretty cool. What we found really quickly, back to my kind of deep sort of data geeks, is that most people start turning off after about 60 seconds. Yeah. So but when I mentioned to my friends at the House of Lords about three minutes, there was obviously a lot of sharp sort of pulling of breath through teeth. How can anyone learn in three minutes? How can anyone learn in three minutes? And obviously I was then forced to correct him and say, well, actually, I'm, I'm sorry, Your Honour, but it's actually more like 60 seconds, right? And of course, it was like, you know, to, to much hilarity. And I said, oh, that's a generational thing. I said, I know that's, that seems silly to you, but you think about how current generations learn things. They're learning things on, on YouTube. They're learning things in snip, snippets of information that they're able to kind of replay to themselves, which is fantastic. And they store it. They never like it or they don't like it. You grab my attention. You mentioned it earlier. You know, how quickly people form a decision, right? Yeah. So you have to make it really, really quick, really chunky, really, really easy for them to understand, really accessible for them to understand. Um, it needs to be in multiple formats. You know, I think that's a, an interesting observation you made earlier, particularly around the, the, the sort of shift in learning to kind of more, you know, VILT, so virtual instructor lets. So yeah. We obviously moved exclusively to VILT. Now we're moving back to ILT. ILT for me, there are definitely pros in that, and there's definitely there's definitely cons in ILT. Um, if I, you know, let's talk about VILT, VILT for a second. So first of all, it's very interactive. I think it's more about the facilitator. So I, I would say that with a, if you've got a really good facilitator, I do a lot of VILT. We have a, we're a global operation. I have people in Sydney, I have people in Chicago, I have people in New York, I have people in London, I have people in Abu Dhabi. Um, first of all, VILT for me levels the playing field. Everyone gets access to it. They yeah, all get yeah, access yeah. to me, yeah. right? Um, of course, I would much prefer to fly to, to New York and deliver a workshop. I've got no problem with that whatsoever. Anyone wants to send me to New York, that's fine, or London or Singapore or wherever. That's all good. But the reality is that that's actually quite small. And actually, you can't, record that not easily anyway yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. so on a vilt i can still if, if i'm a good facilitator i'm able to then probe my my students i'm able to you know to coach them through the learning give them an experience and actually record it record their answers anyone can then, can then listen, to to listen to it yeah. yeah and they can rewind to it so i think there's 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 pros and cons with ilt vilt absolutely the other thing i would say is i think is really important particularly around ebon house and micro learning is the way that I, we try to set, and where I've set up, where I have about 80,000 views every week. So on average, we get about 76,000 to 80,000 views a week. Um, and our main audience is our commercial teams, our guest service teams, our call, our sort of call agent teams. They're the main consumers of the information. And what they tend to see is they see these short micro-learning episodes, 60 seconds, yeah, um, they're rewarded for watching. We can explore that if you want. But, yeah, yeah, but, yeah. but more importantly, they have a, what we call a, um, a, you know, we always ask a secondary question. And the secondary question for me is very, very important because the secondary question is when Chris has watched it, we ask Chris to then complete a multiple you know, multiple choice, multiple guess, whatever you want to call it, um, quiz, normally five or six questions, typically in the format. And then when Chris answers each of those questions, there's a secondary question that asks Chris his confidence level in the correctness. Yep. So Chris will answer B. And so the system then says, so Chris, um, how confident are you? That the answer is B. Yeah. Yeah. Is it, are you very confident? Are you yeah. moderately confident or are you yeah. not confident at all? Because actually then when you put those two bits of data together, you get some very interesting anal- sort of analytics from that. So, the, so Chris might... Well, there's three or four different scenarios. Let's explore four of them for a second here. So the first scenario is that Chris is correct. It is answer B. And he's also saying he's highly confident that's correct. We love Bang. Chris. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. He can move quickly through the system. So you can then quickly move, accelerate through the learning. And we know where he's going. And that's yeah, yeah, we've got yeah, a really yeah. good hang on him. People that probably concern me greatly are people who are saying it's B. The answer is C. And they're saying they're highly confident. Yes. That frightens me. Yeah, yeah, yes. yeah. Especially from a safety-related issue. Yeah. So I know straight away now that that individual there, you know, Chris has obviously got a challenge with that. My Big first, yeah, my first thought is, what have I done wrong? I, 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 I you know, 
I mentioned Dr. Gary offline a few minutes ago. I, you know, Dr. Gary taught me, I've been working with Harvard for about 30 years now. And, and Gary said to me, you have to be think very mindful of the, what he calls sort of send the receiver outcome. So he's a very, very clever chap. I'm very privileged to be in, in, in that kind of space with those kind of people. But he always talks about, you know, changing the message depending on who the receiver is. Yeah. So obviously I have a particular way of communicating. It's the stop style. It's why you know, I'm much more comfortable doing that. But the reality is that actually I'm much better off trying to tune into Chris. Because if I tune into Chris's style, then actually I'm probably going to get more out of that conversation than just staying on the stots kind of wavelength. So yeah, yeah, trying yeah. to understand how he works and how he thinks and actually giving him information that's more powerful to, to him. So, you know, Chris might like to read. He might like to watch a video. He might like to sat, sit next to me and have a conversation. He might ask, might, might ask me to ask him questions. He might like me to show him. He might be a little bit more nervous. So I need to understand really a little bit about Chris so I can make sure that I'm tailoring my message to what Chris needs. Go on, you can ask can me I? a question. Can yeah, I? Please, please, yeah. Can I? Which is fantastic, right? Now, my so my first impressions now, listening to it, it all makes sense. And I'm not the brightest bulb in the chandelier. Oh, all right. right. Join my gang. But, but, and I say a big but here, when you've got some basic practical performance skills that are necessary, especially in, in, in the levels that we're talking about, acceptance of cargo, build-up of cargo, storage, etc., very basic, basic principles. So people might not have the time to be thinking which way does Chris like to be taught, etc. So what I wanted to ask you is, in your expert opinion, if you had care coaches, okay, so people that were identified as loving a specific part of their job, not all of their job, but a specific part of their job, whereby they were so engaged, so passionate, and, and anybody that would be asked, who's the best person at building up a pallet? If the employees said, Andrew... And if the management said Andrew, then surely Andrew is the best person to do it. Now, Andrew might not want to be a teacher, might not want to be a trainer, but he's so passionate about that. If he was given a little bit of help in putting together a practical coaching exercise whereby he had to go through all the people that had to build up pallets and endorse that he had checked them out and they were capable and competent to do it, and the individuals themselves also endorsed the fact that they were given that, and that they now themselves felt confident. That's a little bit similar to the example you gave about the, is this the right question and how confident you are? Yeah. But it's from a more practical perspective. There is one sort of red flag, I suppose, I would kind of raise with that. And that is the, I think it's, it, from a, it's an absolutely, it's a brilliant concept. There's there's four levels. There's, I always talk about my my four kind of leadership tools. Yeah. And, yeah. and there's my, what I would call my instructional, my tell tool, my direct tool. There's also my asking tool, my, yeah. which we call flashy language coaching, but ignore that really. But just really my ability to ask questions. There's the, my, what I have my, my safety tool, which is creating an environment where people feel they can kind of learn with me. Yeah. They don't feel that, you know, because I think one of the big challenges we have is sometimes when we're learning something, you know, stacking a pallet or whatever it might be, sometimes we're, we're a bit nervous to show that we don't know the answer to the question. So how good are we, how good are the coaches at creating an environment where it's safe for them to be challenged and ask questions? A lot back to my kind of brain surgeon I was chatting to earlier yes, last week. But also the, I think the challenges are often the master. It's a bit like juggling because and I, I often do it when I'm, I'm, a, I'm a huge juggler and we didn't mention it earlier, but, on, but, yeah. but I'm a huge juggler. And I suppose it frustrates people because if I go immediately in and I sort of like just show them, you know, a five ball juggle or juggling chainsaws, right? They're kind of going, and I'm not winding you up. I wish I was. Gosh, no, no, wasted, no, no, believe wasted, you. Yeah. Wasted my life. Um, but then people go, oh, it must be really simple, right? So then, of course, what happens is that if I then show you a level of mastery of, of loading the pallet, and then I ask you to do it, and you then find it really, really hard, a lot of people just immediately give up. They go, oh, I can never learn that. So I think we, what we have to do is be careful that we're not showing off to people. You know, I, I sometimes I do it to to cause effect. So when I'm if I'm teaching hundreds of people to juggle, and I will deliberately provoke them by showing them how good I am at juggling. Yeah. But I would say the vast majority of the time I try not to do that, and I'm also caution kind of what I call my closet jugglers because we have we have you know closet jugglers in the room. And as soon as you give them three balls, they like to do it, they start doing these tricks. You know, so I'm always gonna and then, and then I, so I always throw them a fourth ball, and that completely like you know 
buggers I'm out of the way. Um, and if they, if they, they then take the fourth ball, I go, okay, you have a fifth ball then. Yeah, you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, and then sure. I'm trying to push them over the edge because we're to a point where they're not comfortable. Yeah. So I think that's the skill. It's actually, it's that piece of a master teaching someone else. The master has to have the humility and yep, the humbleness to step it back to being more, to be, you know, to teach. It's like when you're learning to drive, you know, it's the same when you're learning to drive. Uh, when you, it looks easy. Right, most people. If you watch someone drive and you and you, you haven't driven, or ride a bike, or juggle, or whatever you want, any any anything looks instant. easy if somebody makes it look easy. Yeah. So when you're mastering, like like when you're doing this with me now, you know you're coming at it from a, a, a level of mastery, right? So therefore, and it was one of the things that we we had. I mean, like years and years ago, I used to do this for Hilton a long time ago, long before the pandemic, long before the technology really existed. But we used to do the same thing with Hilton. And I used to do inductions in like Dallas and stuff like that. And we used to do a thing called NHO, which is a new hire orientation. And we used to have NMO, new manager orientation. We used to bring people in. So any manager who was joining the Hilton Empire um, would spend time with me in groups of people and they would teach them basic leadership. But the interesting thing was that when we started doing our little tiny podcast, People would then try try to imitate that, yeah. Which 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 is a which is a little bit of flattery, but, but it's, it's also normal. It's, yeah, but it was also it was a lot of them then didn't do very well at it. I'm no. not, I wasn't criticised, but yeah, they, yeah, yeah, yeah. they then they I went to a couple of those events where they tried to imitate me, which was fantastic. And I was like, wow, are you amazing? And I dialed in, and it was just like it was, it was a yeah, yeah, was a train yeah chalk crash, and cheese, yeah, train crash, yeah. train crash. And then they phoned me up after and said, oh. Why yeah, didn't just, it work? Why didn't it work? I don't understand. I don't understand stocks, you know, because when I watch you doing that, it just seems so easy. Well, I've got another question for you, right? And it does seem easy watching you. So I can imagine with the chainsaws in Covent Garden now and the crowds building up and the way you would build it up with just turning the, the chainsaw on and then throwing the one up and then people expecting to see stocks, arms and legs flying all over the place and they'd be thinking, oh, my God, how can he do it? And it's a little bit now with the depth that you're able to go into on your subject matter is extensive. Boring. No, 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 no. <laughs> it's, it's extensive. It's extensive. And it, and from a leadership perspective, I think it's it, it enlightens people in how the new leadership concept needs to take on board so many different things, juggling all the differences with whether somebody's a left back, a goalkeeper or a centre forward or how do they prioritise from critical, important and recommended? And uh, But what I'm trying to do, I'm, I'm trying to let people see that if you follow a four C's principle, so clarity, competence, compliance and control, when the control and the compliance starts to fall down, it always, nearly always goes back to the clarity side. So yeah. the original in, intention wasn't there. And when I'm talking about care coaches with our industry, one of the things that would be extraordinary is if we did the ordinary very well. And, and and unfortunately, we don't. And to help people just do things that make an immediate impact into their into their practice within the business, that's what I'm talking about on the care coaching. So yeah. not about, you know, getting them to a level where they're taking in lots of consideration. Obviously, they have to have humility to teach anybody. But at the end of the day, if we're building pallets or, or if you're doing pushbacks or whatever, you can't give people an overly amount of time to grasp it. Either they're able to do it or they're not because it's all about incidents and safety and damage. So my question to you is, it would almost be like, instead of giving you five chainsaws to juggle, I'm just going to give you two eggs. Yeah. And and can, can you do something simple, not you personally, but do you think this industry can do it now, moving away from the tick box exercise, the, the memory testing, so that people can actually build their own skills base and their own skills value to upskill, multi-skill, cross-skill, so they can see that if they add those little building blocks of competencies, they're more valuable to the organisation, God forbid something similar to COVID ever happened or, or, or after that. One one hundred percent. I mean, the, the uh, we there's a, another massive project that I'm working on at the moment called um, Success Profiles and Career Connections. So I think that's the inter- the the reason I've, I'm kind of grabbing my bits of paper is because we've if you it, exactly what you're saying about kind of building skills. If you take a a job role here yeah. and you take another job role here, and we've we've broadly identified about three hundred job roles for Etihad, right? So. Any, you know, I took any any of those three hundred job roles. His random one, his number six, for example. And I, I, what I can do is, I can then layer that job role against that job role, yep. and then instantly find out where the gaps are. Yep. Yeah, and then we can develop those gaps. And actually, what we find is that there's a lot of synergy between many of the job roles. 
Yeah, so actually some of the sort of kind of core skills are there. And I would totally agree with you. I mean, that, for me, there's, I speak to a lot of leaders and one of the things that I do when I speak to my, you know, our, our internal lead, I've, I've interviewed all of our internal senior leaders, including, you know, Martin, those guys, and Mohamed Baluki and Tony Douglas and all those guys, Dr. Nadia. So I've, I've interviewed all of them and I've asked them the same kind of questions. And that, and for me, it all kind of distills down to, to five key, six, key simple things. Number one is clarity. Yeah. I actually love you for that too. For me, clarity gives, if I have clarity and I'm, I know what I'm being asked to do and I'm clear about what I'm being asked to do and we've agreed what I'm being asked to do, the hardest thing in leadership for me, and it's really, really hard, is feedback. Yeah. And, and it's, it's kind of self-awareness and it's actually feedback. However, if, we've, if we kind of, I hate that word, but if, if we nail clarity, if Chris knows what we're asking him to do and he's very clear about that, and we've asked him to describe it back to us and explain to us what he's going to do. And he's really clear. And then he doesn't do it. Actually, it's, it's feedback becomes a much easier game. Yeah. And Chris is going to be much happier with that feedback, right? Where Chris gets upset is that he's given some feedback and he's not really clear what he's being asked to do. Yeah. That's where the frustration comes, right? And then you do some brilliant analogies, almost what we've met in a previous life, uh, Chris. So then we talk, you know, what I would call, um, you know, input versus output. So I think it's absolutely critical. I think that's a, there's a, I, I talk a lot about kind of what I call bubble management. So it's about how I'm handing the bubble off. Because I think sometimes if I understand the previous part of the journey of the, of the item, the goods, um, the, the guest, um, if I understand where that has come from yep. and where it's going. And, storyline. Uh, yeah, the journey. storyline, yeah. Yep. Then it becomes much easier for me because I can actually then start preparing. Because yep. I know that, I'm, that this, this individual is going to give me this information. I went to, um, to Toyota um, I was really lucky. I won't give you the full story, but but effectively, um, the the managing director of Toyota in the UK lived in my house. Um, we went to Australia to work a few years ago now, and I still own the house in the UK. But he they wanted to. Um, I put my house on the market to be let, and the um, it is important part of the story. But so anyway, it was on the market. For, it was on the market for about six hours, and then we had a phone call from Toyota. Um, I kid you not. Um, Oh, yes, it's, it's Mr. Slotterbrook, yes. Um, this is Toyota UK here. It's like, hmm, that's yeah. interesting. Um, we'd like to hire you. We'd like to rent your house. It's like, wow. Okay, fine. So so you'll be the landlord for Toyota in the UK. Is that okay? I was like, crack on. You know, <laughs> where, do I, where do I sign? So that yeah. was fine. I said, well, who wants to live in my house? Oh, the managing director of um, the Toyota. His wife um, has selected your house, and so there's some there's some really good schools. There's a very expensive prep school uh, about 100 meters away from my house in the UK, um, in Epsom called Castle. And so anyway, so long long boring story. He came to my house, and I met him, and he was with his wife and his 11 year old son, and we had a conversation. And he said, "You should come to Toyota." And I was like, "Because <laughs> he was saying, what do you do for a living?" And I said, "Oh, I'm going to be head of learning for like PNO, um, going to the merchant maybe." And he was laughing. Why are you going to Australia? You know, that kind of... Anyway, um, but he said to me, what's fascinating is that when you come to Toyota, and why don't we show you around Toyota? Right? Let me show you. To, have you ever been to a car plant? I'm not sure if you've ever been to Yeah, a, yeah, yeah, I have. Yeah, yeah. Amazing, yeah. right? Um, um, read, up on, read up on Toyota. Demings and, and, and Demings. Yeah, and Deming, Deming, yeah. Deming, it's amazing. Right? Yeah. I mean, if you ever want more, I can pull for England on this. But, and I was obviously terrified because I know nothing about... Uh, who's your, sorry, who's your other? Deming and... Well, there's there's there's, 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 there's there's Mayo, there's Deming, there's lots of I can't think of the other guy. Edward Deming's is the guy who's the main, yeah. like the, the after the war, yeah, yeah, the father yeah. of kind of coaching. Yeah. But what was real? I, I even well, I live in I live in the UE, so I can't even put petrol in my car anymore. I've given up on that kind of like tour. That was the only my only skill set in was driving the car. As far as anything to do with the car, putting oil and gas. You know, I don't even do that anymore. I used to maybe top the oil up occasionally and I obviously put the petrol in because I live in the UK. But these days, gas and petrol, I don't touch that either. I just sit there with my air conditioning on. Um, but I remember turning up at this Toyota garage, this Toyota factory. They built to- Toyota Corollas in Swindon. And when I, when I got there, um, I think there was, there was a couple of things that I've really resonated with me. First of all was the different Mr. Cuck. His name was Mr. Cuck. And when he was in his house, my house, you know, uh, it, it was always, it was very, it, it was a diff, totally different relationship. When I walked up at his place of work, he was like the managing director for Toyota UK, right? So when I, when I walk up at his place of work, 
he's obviously in a slightly different status kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, the whole yeah, relationship yeah, thing is yeah, kind yeah, of like, yeah, you know, yeah. it's all a bit skewed, right? Um, so he then asked me a couple of very troubling questions at the beginning. And the first question was, like, you, you have complete kind of accountability and responsibility for everything you're doing. And I said, okay. And what is, uh, I said, can I just ask, what does that exactly mean? He said, well, you're going to go into... In a minute, you're going to go into the shop floor and you're going to see, you know, lots of people doing lots of things and lots of quite a dangerous environment to go into. Yeah. And you have to take, you're, you're going to be responsible for that, right? And I fully expect you to have complete responsibility and complete accountability for your actions inside there. Yeah. And actually, it's a bit of a deal breaker. So, you know, I can't let you really continue unless you kind of like sign this bit of paper saying yeah, that you're yeah, taking yeah, yeah, responsibility yeah, yeah. for your actions. So I kind of, what I said, okay, well, well how do I execute my accountability and how do I execute my responsibility in this factory, right? And he said, well, it's, it's really simple. They have a thing called the Andon cord. Um, and when you go in, you effectively, um, there's, there's some like fluorescent buttons or there's a fluorescent cable that runs around the entire length of the factory on the assembly line. And he said, if, you, if you're concerned about anything at any point, um, we'd encourage you to pull the Andon cord. Right? So I was like, oh, God, okay. I said, what happens if I pull the Andon cord? He goes, the entire factory Stop. stops. Right, <laughs> and I was like, "Wow, okay, that's interesting." Um, but what's really fascinating for me, I was in the air for about I was there for about ninety minutes. Right, how many times do you think the Andon cord was pulled? I, I'll give you the it's a rhetorical question because he, he, it was pulled, I think, six times in that like ninety minutes. Right, so that's six times in ninety minutes, the entire factory comes to a halt. Right, and the next question is, well, okay, so how did they ever build any cars? Because it yeah, sounds yeah, crazy. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, the idea that someone would run and get Mr. Cuck, yeah. I guess I'm being slightly facetious there. You know, you know, someone runs and gets a manager and says, oh, you need to come help me fix this problem here. Absolutely, 100% not. The person who's fixing the problem is the person who's pulled the Andon cord. Yeah, right? yeah. And they pull the Andon cord because they are the expert in that thing. It might be a headlight assembly. It might be yeah, a wheel yeah, fitting yeah. a windscreen or whatever. So they, have, they are the absolute master of that unit, of that particular Corolla, right? So they... They need to, if they, if they see something, they could easily fudge it, right? They could easily fudge it and make it kind of fix. But the problem is that as it goes to the next, you know, on that kind of like that storyline or that journey or that bubble. That's exactly it. That's why you get callbacks. Yeah, they get callbacks and it's a disaster. And then you don't have the reliability. So I was looking in the past, you know, the paper yesterday about the most the most reliable car in the Middle East is Lexus, Toyota, Lexus, you know, most reliable car, never breaks down. Least reliable car, Land Rover, right? So I was reading that in the paper yesterday. To much hilarity. But it's because if you go to a Toyota factory, you realize why their cars are so reliable. Because everyone is accountable and responsible for their job. There's a big difference between accountability and responsibility, but they all have complete and utter mastery of what they're doing. I want to bring you... Sorry, Chris. You just say a nice segue there. Right. ICAO states that you can delegate responsibility, but you can't delegate accountability. Yeah. All right. So bringing back now everything and all your experiences and everything you've touched on, which is fantastic. And I think the other one I was thinking about was Cosby. Yeah. Demi, yeah, good. So just coming back now with safety and the importance of practical performance having an impact on safety. With all the things now that we've covered, okay, do you feel that we need to be simpler in our approach but very practical to make sure that people fully understand whether they're in a position of responsibility or accountability. And coming back to the four C's, if the clarity of what they're doing, so you, you spoke about job descriptions, I like to use the minimum expectation documents so that people can see what the minimum expectations are and then you, you look at the behaviour outcomes and the actual performance outcomes. Um, so if that's in play and, and we're looking at safety and we've given them the clarity, we've given them the right level of coaching and coursework and LMS mixed in, then the compliance should be better than it is at the moment. Do you, do you yeah, agree one, with that? 100% agree. I think, do you know what, my, this is a very, my, my mind is kind of like spinning. Um, I'm really enjoying our conversation. I think one of the biggest challenges I have, and it's like, I've been, I think we're probably of a similar age. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm almost 60, been in the space for about 40 years now doing this kind of work. And, and, and obviously a certain amount of mastery comes along with that kind of experience because most of it is just trying to do stuff in different industries yes, and yeah, work in different yeah. industries. And it's, it's pretty and much... see similarities. See, you see a lot of similarities because yeah. it's really weird. Because it was... I mean, I, I, it's fascinating. I, was, I think it's a... Um, 
I, I interviewed the head of NASA in my podcast a few months ago, and it was very interesting. And you'd think, well, NASA has, a, you know, they attract the greatest engineers in the world, the greatest pilots, greatest scientists, mathematicians, yada, 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 which I think is fascinating. But when I spoke to Paul from NASA, he was saying his name's Coulson Atlas, and he's the guy who like, sits in the control center and decides whether they launch the fucking must, the, the rocket into space. I mean, you know, that's a good job, right? Um, and, but he was saying, you know, the problem is that stops. The problem from NASA isn't the the, the brilliance of the engineers or the brilliance of the team. That's not the issue. The challenge is the, is the lead, the, 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 the diabolical challenge with leadership, you know, it's a totally different thing because we just assume we promote the best engineer. Yeah, yeah, no, 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 no. Yeah. And that's yeah. a real issue. And it's a shame because now you're losing a great engineer and you're getting not a great leader. And that's, and this is where there's a massive, that's where, that's where we have to really fix it. We have to, because some people just are really great engineers. Yep. They're just not going to cut it as a and, leader. And let them be good. Let them be good engineers. Yep. You know, reward them for being great engineers. That's it. It's like I, I worked for a while in the fitness industry. And one of the big challenges we used to have these brilliant personal trainers, brilliant kind of fitness guys who were just all over the body. And it was they were amazing. And then we'd promote them to managers. They'd be useless managers. Yep, 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 and then yep. we'd lose this brilliant fitness guy who was just amazingly into interacting with guests, customers, members. Knowledge, incredible knowledge, real passionate about what the, the body and physio and yeah. how to do all sorts of different things. It's amazing. And then we would take them away from what they were really good at and we push them up into like a management role and be a nightmare. But don't, so, don't you think that's one of the biggest problems that we've got is that we don't recognise when people are good and, and, and bring them along a journey of from good to great in what they do very well. But we make them also believe that the only way they can better themselves is by trying something that they're not good at and they'll never be great. Yeah, and it's in this, I mean, we've, there's a, obviously the Gallup stuff around sort of like Strength Finder. And, oh. I, and this is what Harvard, I mean, I, I spent a lot of time with, um, with my friends at Harvard and they were, they were always saying, well, why do we focus on people's weaknesses? Why do we try and focus on weakness? Why don't we identify where their strengths are and play and really develop the strength yeah, yeah. as opposed to saying, we don't, you know, we've got a real weakness here, Andrew. Let's, let's work on that weakness. But the, Right, I've done loads of them as well, and all the colours, and, mm. and well, you've got a bit of this and a bit of that. The, I've got to be honest now, the, the, the thing that I've, I wouldn't say research, but I checked on is, what what did people actually feel after that exercise? Because it's great when you're being shown and you walk through it and you do all your filling in your questionnaires and you do all that, and then they tell you who you are and what you are and where you're better off and everything, which is fantastic. But that's too much. For groundwork in some of the business, no, and it's far agree. too much. No, it and the agree. amount of waste that goes on afterwards, because the leaders don't do anything, in my opinion, any other. Nineteen of twenty-four, I think, that I checked on, they didn't follow it up, and it was never, never put into. So you do all your drums and you do all your teamwork exercises, but they don't follow it through. And I think people get frustrated when they see leaders going off on these sort of really, you know, highfalutin exercises and don't bring anything back for the impact on the business. Completely agree. And the journey and the storyline, which is the clarity of where you want to take people and make them proud of working with a brand or a company, especially like Etihad and here in Abu Dhabi, which is, I think is, is, is a wonderful Absolutely thing to do. Stellar, it's brilliant. Yeah. The story, and you said about NASA, the story that I love about NASA was when J.F. Kennedy... Go cleaner, it off. the cleaner. And the cleaner. Yeah, send them out to the moon and return and when to earth. Exactly. My, my favourite quote of all time. What a fantastic... That that man had a bigger vision than most of the people who were worried, why did Kennedy want to go back down to the canteen and be yeah. introduced to that guy? True North. It's this, yeah. it's, and then we do it at induction every every day. I do it on, every Monday I do it at induction. And we we try to... we, we, we it's, it's actually quite... Um, it's a bit weird, really. It's a bit surreal because oh, there's a great picture of um, Sheikh Zayed in the corner of our conference centre, our conference room. And I always, people, you know, people kind of like, I get, it's a great activity. Try it at home. Um, anyone who wants, anyone who's listening to this, try it at home. But get, you know, get a group of people to close their eyes, ask them to point where they think north is, right? And then keep them pointing, but ask them to open their eyes. And you'll see that they're all pointing in different directions. That's it. I think half the battle is actually aligning and clarity, right? Yep. And then, of course, in our conference room, Sheikh Zayed is north. It's, it's, I think, more chance than anything else. But then getting people to point north is, is gives them direction, really. Yep. I, 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 there's What I would really focus leaders on is four, there's four kind of questions that I try to really um, focus them on. Because yep. let, me, let me try and explain those four questions sort of one step at a time. The, the first question is often we, we, we've got to get better at asking questions. We have to get leaders have to get much get better at asking questions. The, one of the big times I have, I suppose, with and it's not an Etihad thing. It, it definitely exists with an Etihad, but it's definitely a Hilton thing. It's a you know Pizza Hut thing. It's a Starbucks thing. It's a Samsung thing. It's a PLA thing. It doesn't make any difference where you get Barclays Bank thing. 
is always the same. Leaders tend to have to be the experts, and they yep. really don't. Yep. No, they're no. not doing it. You no. know? It's like Mr. Cuck, right? He is not, he, he's like, I'm not the expert. The man who puts the windscreen in is the expert. Let's ask him how to fix it. Because if we ask him how to fix it, he knows how to fix it. Why is he coming to me, wasting time? I'm not the expert yep. in that. Yeah. So let's just try to get to the habit of asking, of empowering him, giving him responsibility to make the right decision. So that's really important. So the first question I, I always try to say to people is, because they say, well, okay, it's all very nice, Andrew. I like the idea of the... Um, of what you're talking about. How do I really use it? And I said, okay, let's just really cut away the, the BS here. What I would recommend you do is you try to like be very focused on four questions that you ask yourself. This is These are questions for me, okay? They're not questions for the person who's coming with the problem because there's yeah. going to be a, this, this individual is going to manifest with a problem in front of you. It could be any problem. So the first, the first question I asked myself was, at this moment, as that person knocks on the door or they, they present with their problem, what's going on for me? Yeah. yeah, have I got time for this? Because it's going to take a bit longer to deal with this. If I want to do it properly, I could just give them the answer, but actually, I'm going to. That's going to be counterproductive because in the long in the long run, that's going to drive their dependence on me. And actually, what I want them to be empowered. So I need. So I need to be. The more I can kind of get them to, I can ask them questions about their problem and get them to try and think about solutions to their problem. Um, there's a great book actually, the One Minute Manager Meets the Monkey. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. But don't, awesome. don't, don't you think that's a terrible thing that's a trait now in leaders where the first thing they say is, oh, my schedule's too full. I yeah, got too me, I'm, I'm going from meeting to meeting. Too busy well, if they go to meet to meeting, somebody should tell them where you're not managing your time properly. Yeah, you're, you're definitely you're wasting your time going to meet to meeting 100%. So you, but I was think, yeah, so try to get into the habit of saying, okay, what's going on for me right now? Can we? Let's avoid just giving them the answer because the more that we give yes, them answers, yes. the more we drive dependence. Yeah, and, then, exactly. and also the more we drive blaming because I'll tell you what, if I say, Chris, what should I do? And you say, okay, stop, let's go and do this. I go and do it. And this is what you told me. Yeah, yeah, Chris told me to do that. Yeah. That was Chris. Yeah. Chris told me to do that. And there's an email from Chris telling me, yeah, yeah um, here it is, yeah, in writing. So that's the, first, that's the first question. The second question I would say is what's going on for them right yeah. now because sometimes we need to be mindful that they perhaps don't have the time at that particular moment. There might be something else going on that we're not aware of. So just trying to understand where they are when they come with a problem is going to be really useful for you. So, you know, there's 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 what's, what's happening for you, what's happening for them in yeah. that conversation. You do need to create a little bit of space. It's sometimes you have to just kind of like stop the wheel just a few moments because it's, we're too busy for this kind of rubbish, Andrew. I get that, but you're always going to be too busy until you die. You need some, if you really want to develop, you have to start asking a few more questions of your team. The third question, I think, is the most important question because it's really, and this is going to sound, I always think it's quite profound. I always say it's a bit like a self fulfilling prophecy because that person yep. is not going to come to you unless they have a relationship with you. Yep, yep, 100%. So therefore, we need to invest a lot more time in having relationships with our team members. And I'm not talking about, I'm just talking about saying good morning, you know, actually creating a bit of trust. Yes, Actually yes, walking yes, the talk. Yes, Actually yes, doing yes, some of the yes. basics. Feet on you know? ground. Yeah, feet on ground. Just just get, getting in amongst it, yeah. asking a couple of questions. You know, asking, I, I a long time ago, I, there's a, I ran a, at the time, it was the, the world's busiest um, busiest restaurant. I mean, it's huge. Ten thousand. We used to serve ten thousand meals a day. Ten thousand a la carte meals a day. It's, uh, when I started that job, I was like, "I'm never going to do this." I remember, I remember it so well. My first day, um, but in the centre of London, literally in Leicester Square in the Haymarket, um, a queue of people um, continuously. We opened at eleven in the morning, closed at like two in the morning. Um, and we'd have a queue of people from 11 a.m. There'd be like 100 people queuing outside. And then what's the name of the restaurant? Uh, TJ Fridays in the oh. market. Yeah. So we used to serve like 10. Do you know Fridays? Yeah, 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 yeah. It's opposite Planet Hollywood. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's quite funny because when we, if you know, I, did, I didn't realise it was that big in there. Oh, massive! Yeah, 400 covers. Oh, blimey! Yeah. 400 covers plus about another 200 around the bar. Yeah, we used to turn it about at least 10, 20 times a day. I mean, it was some days we were doing. Um, I'm talking about 98, 97, 98. Yeah, when I was sort of general manager there, it was fascinating. But I also it was it was you got me on, a, um, so I'm not I'm probably not a very good guest for you. But I was. Let me come back. So there's the. Sorry, I'll, I'll tell you. I've got to give you another challenge now. Go on. Right, and this is this is now a little bit of time pressure. My cameras are now running out of power. It's a testimony to how interesting how interesting this exercise is going. But just before we we lose power, do you want to finish those four? 
those four statements. Yeah, there's the fourth. Yeah, so the, the the first one. Let me just for clarity. So I do apologise to Chris. Yeah. So first of all, it's about what's going on for me. Yep. Yeah. At the moment, Got it. what's going on for them? Yeah. Then especially, do I have a relationship? Exactly. Because, you know, I have to ask myself, why would Chris come to me and ask me the question? Yeah. And then the the, the fourth thing is where are we having this conversation. I think sometimes we we we're having conversations too publicly, and we need to have conversations privately. We have a conversation privately. Do you know what? Then more Chris is going to be more open with me. He's going to be more challenging of me. If if I'm in the middle of a you know, I talk about the hippo, you know, the highest paid person in the room, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. If I'm sat with Chris and he's the highest paid person in the room, I sit in meetings with Antonado, our CEO. I, I sit in those meetings all the time and it's a nightmare because no one wants to say anything. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, I agree. Yeah, because he's there. And if, if he wasn't there, then we'd have a conversation. We should yeah. really go and have a conversation yeah. and then discuss what we, what we think we should do as yeah. opposed to we don't. Yeah, but don't, don't be fair. All, all these things you've touched on, and, and, and the, the, the main point of what I was trying to do there was about safety, SMS, just culture, mm. all those things, and new leadership learning, minimum expectation criteria. If people were taught some of these obvious areas, we'd, we'd do away with some of the illnesses that leaders tend to bring on themselves. Mm. And it's almost like, you know, if you're told don't go there because this will happen, they, they just all go there like lemmings. And then you've got the too busy meeting after meeting, can't spend time with you. Like you said, you know, instead of showing the shouting, instead of telling this teach should be teaching, it, all of that reaps dividends. And if you don't, if you don't sow, you're never going to reap. So I think this new leadership approach, hundred percent, but balanced needs to be just a very quick, practical performance injection into the baseline business to keep that, business going because also I think too many support services don't realise that they're a cost. The yeah. core business is what's bringing the revenue in and that needs to be supported. Yeah. And the more support services you've got, they operate independently and there's no filter to stop putting too much pre- unnecessary administrative pressure onto the core business. Yeah, if I, d- d- two, two final things. And then I, cause I think there's, I've had, I've had a lot of bosses in my life and, and I, one very, 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 very famous boss who's a massive TV celebrity and I worked with him for a, for, for a while and he was a very interesting guy and but he was a nightmare to work with because he just didn't want any bad news right and so it was a very very interesting relationship with him I was his HR director for a while and whenever he no one because he was given bad news he'd fire you yeah, 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 yeah. so therefore Unfortunately, people think, well, you know, they, they, they wouldn't want to give him bad news, right? And I worked with another guy who was a multi-billionaire Dutch guy called Harm. And Harm was the absolute um, opposite of, of my other, I can't say him because everyone would instantly know who he is. Um, and I don't want to do that. But but Harm was the opposite of the first guy because Harm was always saying, stop, it's about the bad news, mate. I need yeah. the bad news now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Because because bad, know, worst case scenario. Yeah, if you yeah. give me the bad news, then I know how to deal with it. I'm yeah. not, no one's going to get, so however bad the news is coming into me, I'm, At least he knows. I'm going to be listening and we're yeah. going to have a conversation around it and I'm going to be completely calm. Yeah. yeah. And that's, I think, is amazing because then people always wanted to come to harm and they wanted to give, let know what's happening yeah, yeah. around him, yeah, right? Yeah. As opposed to keeping it really, really secret. And then I've just, I said last week, I spoke to that, that kind of, um, that, um, my, my brain surgeon in the podcast in our World Class Wednesday series. And, you know, when I asked him about the Frankenstein, so I, I said to him... You know, oh, yeah, 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 this yeah, is one. This is, I, it's a good way to finish. Yeah, so that's what I thought. That's what I a thought, good Chris. finish. That's what Excellent. I thought, Chris, yeah. yeah. So I, I asked, I asked um, Dr. Chris Thomas, his name is, um, and he's an amazing... He's a, he's a, heart, he's a like, you know, brain surgeon, heart surgeon, um, works in, in Nottingham um, National Health Service. And I said to him, you're going to build the perfect leader, you know, from like Frankenstein-esque. Yeah. And how well would you go about doing it? And, and he paused... And I have to say, I just love this so much. And he said, first of all, I'd be looking for the biggest pair of ears I could find because we need leaders to be just listening a bit more and speaking a little bit less. That's really important. Yeah. Secondly, because I'd find like the, the most amazingly big eyes because they need to be able to see what's going on around them. They need to be self-aware. They need to be reflecting on what's kind of happening. And that's really important. And then, and you know what, honestly, they need a massive heart. Yeah. You know, yeah. they need a huge heart. That's what people love. That's what people love, you know. And, that, and it's, I know there's all the data and all that kind of stuff, but just trying to get people to buy into it and just yeah. giving clarity. And there's a, you know, there's a, the guy called Alan Mayo who we didn't speak about, but, you know, Mayo some really interesting experiments in the sort of like you know early 20th century and what may have found one of the big things that drives me is that probably the biggest and most influential thing is just caring yep about your people and that is a beautiful segue into this care series which we think etihad is an absolute classic to support it and uh, and endorse it and the one thing i've realized if you want to be a great leader 
from the um, Frankenstein principles, you might not be the best looking leader, but you'll definitely be a... <laughs> That would definitely apply One to that me, would Chris. stand out. Thank so, you for listening to me. Appreciate it. Honestly, I could go on for hours, and it's only the batteries that are uh, that are letting us down now. Thank you so much. Have fun, my friend.